All right, let's get started. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Today we have four speakers talking to you about social privilege. Now, people often ask me, Katie, why is it that women take so long to get ready to go out at night? To which I say, between the hair and the makeup and the mace and the fully charged cell phone and the self-defense classes, no wonder I'm late to everything. The burden of safety precautions is a part of what women have to carry in their everyday living. And the lack of burden or the lack of worries about gender discrimination more broadly is often what constitutes male privilege. Today, I will talk to you about how social privilege often comes in the form of the absence of inconveniences and hence is invisible to those who have them. But what happens when privilege is made visible? Taylor will talk about how people get defensive and uncomfortable when confronted with their privilege and the strategies they use to cloak their privilege. In the second half of the symposium, An Yi will discuss how systems of economic capitalism might privilege men. And lastly, Serena will show us what happens when you make wealth privilege transparent and how it only makes rich people buy more things they don't want. We will have a Q&A session at the very end and we ask you to hold all questions until then. So without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker, Katie Wu from the University of Michigan, who is me, talking to you about the invisibility of social privilege. But before I begin, I'd like to show you a couple of objects, and I want you to raise your hand the moment you notice a common theme. Okay, for those of you who raise your hand, what's the theme? Exactly, very smart crowd. These are objects uh, left-handed people often have to be mindful of every day. If you are left-handed, what is the question on your mind when you walk into a lecture hall to take an exam? Is there a chair left for me that has a left-handed desk? Concerns like this seep through the objects in the physical surroundings for left-handers, concerns that right-handers don't necessarily have to worry about them every day. And it is the absence of daily inconveniences that makes right-handedness a social privilege. What is social privilege? We define social privilege as the rights or advantages that people of the dominant social groups receive based solely on their group membership. Social privilege is often invisible to the people who have them. It is invisible because privilege is as much about the presence of benefits as the absence of burdens. It is so easy to overlook the difficulties others have to endure, and it is so easy to overlook the absence of these difficulties in our own lives. People are often unaware of the privileges they enjoy, and we call this the hypocognition of social privilege. What is hypocognition? If you don't know, you've just experienced it. Hypocognition is not knowing a concept, and to be hypocognitive of social privilege is to not have a cognitive representation of privilege, the advantages we enjoy, but more importantly, the disadvantages we don't have to endure. And just like how it was difficult, sort of, to piece together the left-handed objects from early on, hypocognition deprives us of seeing the connections among instances of disadvantages we don't have to face. And today we'll take a deeper look at the hypocognition uh, of white and male privilege. Now, a few months ago, there was a tweet going around in which educator Jackson Katz described a class exercise. He drew a line down the blackboard and asked the men and women to write on either side of the board what they would do on a daily basis to protect themselves from being assaulted. This is what men came up with. Stay out of prison. In the exercise, not necessarily representative of all men, but what about the women? Hold my key as a potential weapon, check the back seat before getting my car, always carry a cell phone. The list goes on and on and on and on. I asked the women in my own life, do these safety precautions ring a bell? 
ring a bell. They started giving me their own laundry list of safety precautions. Never give your apartment number to a food delivery guy. But if you did, make sure to have a pair of man's shoes near the door to signal you have a male companion inside. Never get on an elevator with a lone man at night. But if you did, let him press the button first, because you don't want to press the button and have the attacker say, same as you. And the scheme gets more and more elaborate. It's as if women have a mental checklist that they routinely perform. They have, over time, built this rich network of safety precautions, a mental burden they carry with them every day. In this study, we wanted to empirically test, are men actually less schematic of safety precautions than women? Is the burden of self-protection more hypocognized among men? We had people read through 10 safety actions adapted from that list, uh, like hold one's key as a potential weapon. And these are mixed up with five distractor items, like make a grocery list. And then we gave people a distraction task. After that, we asked them to write down as many actions as they can recall. The idea is that if men were hypocognitive of their privilege, unaware of the absence of self-protection burdens, they would be more likely to see these actions as isolated actions rather than actions with a unifying schema of safety. And they would show the classic cognitive signature of lacking schema, worse memory. And that's exactly what we found. Men recalled fewer safety precautions than women. They were less schematic of the burden of self-protection. We also had two attitudinal measures. We first measured awareness of male privilege through items like men have it easier than women. Our social structure system promotes male privilege. And we found that men on average were less aware of male privilege. The second attitude measure we had was how much discrimination people think there was against women and men over the past seven decades. And these are the responses from women. Women think that discrimination against women, the red bars, have decreased since the 1950s. And there's a slight increase in discrimination against men, the blue bars. And this is largely consistent with the recent Pew Research uh, Center data showing that things are getting better, but women still say that they face considerable gender discrimination in 2019 relative to men. Now, what did the men in our study say about gender discrimination? We see a steeper decline in how much discriminating they think there is against women and a much sharper rise in discrimination against men. Now, these attitudinal findings are not news in the white privilege literature, which says that people from dominant racial groups don't see the privileges that they have. They see less racism in mainstream society, and some claim reverse racism against white people. Why might this be the case? One idea is identity defense, which suggests that people are aware of the privileges that they have to some extent, and they are motivated to reduce guilt and maintain a sense of innocence by cloaking their privilege. But there could also be a form of cognitive ignorance that precedes motivational defense. One accounts the Marley hypothesis, a nod to Bob Marley's lyric, says privilege denial does not need to be entirely motivational. In fact, whites who are ignorant of historical reality of racism tends to see less racism, regardless of how much they want to appear non-racist, or in this era, how much they want to uh, appear openly racist. And this suggests that difference in racial attitudes can be explained by cognitive deficits. Now let's return to our data. We wanted to see if hypocognition as a cognitive deficit underlies gender difference in attitudes, and we found that to be the case. Men were less schematic, more hypocognitive of safety precautions, and less schematicity in turn predicted lower awareness of male privilege. Hypocognition also mediated gender difference in perceived discrimination from the 1970s to the present. Okay, in the next study, we looked at hypocognition of male privilege in the context of gender discrimination more broadly. Few of us have lived life as both male and female. But those who have transgender men and women are often astounded by the challenges faced by the other gender, not that they are the other gender. Paula Stone Williams is one such transgender woman who realized after transition the male privilege she once had, the male privilege she has now lost. 
And I will let Paula tell you herself about one of the incidents that she encountered as female in her TED Talk. The first time I flew as Paula, I was going from Denver to Charlotte. And I got in the plane and there was stuff in my seat. So I picked it up to put my stuff down, and a guy said, that's my stuff. I said, okay, but it's in my seat. So I'll just hold it for you until you find your seat, and then I'll give it to you. He said, lady, that is my seat. I said, yeah, actually, it's not. It's my seat. <laughs> 1D, 1D. But I'll be glad to hold your stuff until you find your seat. He said, what do I have to tell you? That is my seat. I said, yeah, it's not. <laughs> At which point, the guy behind me said, lady, would you take your effing argument elsewhere so I can get in the air airplane? I was absolutely stunned. I had never been treated like that as a male. I would have said, I believe that's my seat. And the guy immediately would have looked at his boarding pass and said, oh, I'm sorry, I know that because it happened all the time. The flight attendant took our boarding passes. She said to the guy, sir, you're in 1C. She's in 1D. I put his stuff down in 1C. He said not one single word. And of course, you know who was next to me in 1F. <laughs> Mr. Would you take your effing argument elsewhere? So this goes on about uh, 10 minutes or so, in which Paula detailed numerous struggles she faced living as female. And what we're interested in is this. One day after watching the TED Talk, how many instances do you think men versus women can retain and recognize? Are men less schematic of everyday gender discrimination than women? Will they be less accurate in recognizing discrimination instances mentioned in the talk? In this study, we had participants watch the talk, and a day later, we reached back out and said, here's a list of things Paula may or may not have mentioned. And we included instances mentioned uh, in the video, like being explained things in which they have knowledge by a man, AKA mansplaining. We also included uh, lures, which were related to gender discrimination, but not mentioned in the video, like being dismissed when having an idea, which is then applauded when a man repeats it, AKA he peeing. We asked people to rate how certain they were about seeing these instances in the video. And then we formed an index of recognition accuracy known as D prime. And we did this by taking the difference between the hit rate, how many instances people correctly recognized, and the false alarm rate, how many instances people misidentified. The higher the D prime value is, the more accurate people are, and the more schematic they are of gender discrimination. What did we find? Men were less accurate in recognizing discrimination instances than women a day after they saw the video. This hypocognition explained why men were less aware of male privilege. It also explained why men saw less gender discrimination over the past seven decades. Okay, in the last study, we looked at hypocognition of white privilege, and I want to share with you a published interview with Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, a Nigerian novelist who said something to the effect of, if I get spit on in Africa, I know that person's a jerk, but if I get spit on in America, I have a problem, because I don't know if that person's a jerk or a racist. But here's the interesting bit. The longer she stayed in America, the better she became at telling the racial overtones. She has, over time, accrued a reservoir of racial discrimination instances to help her deal with the racial discrimination she has to face in the United States. Here's Adichie. When things happen to me in the US, and I suspect it's racist, and it doesn't have to be massive, it can just be when someone doesn't extend the dignity and courtesy to you. And you can tell they would be different with a white person. You can tell. And there are times when the white person has been nasty and I've known it wasn't race. I mean, I've dealt with grumpy old white men who I just sense are the same with everybody. But you can tell. You can always tell. Now, we don't know if she can actually tell, but here's the thing with white privilege, which is one doesn't have to go through 50 shades of ambiguity and inner turmoil when hearing a compliment like, you are so articulate for a black person. 
having white privilege alleviates the burden of developing a mental dictionary to deal with everyday racial discrimination. And in this study, we tested the question, are whites less schematic of everyday racial discrimination than blacks? Like the male privilege study, we showed participants instances um, of racial discrimination, like being followed by security while shopping. These are mixed up with filler instances, and this was followed by a distraction task like before, and after that we asked people to write down as many instances as they can recall. What did we find? Well, whites recalled fewer discrimination instances than blacks. We also found that whites were less aware of white privilege. And similar to the gender study, this ethnic difference in awareness of privilege was explained by difference in schematicity, such that whites were less schematic of racial discrimination, and in turn, they were less aware of the privilege that they have. What about perceived discrimination? Blacks saw a steady decrease up in discrimination against blacks over time, good news, but there's no increase in discrimination against whites. White participants beg to differ. They see a greater decline in discrimination against blacks, and there's a much sharper rise in perceived discrimination against whites. And similar to before, lack of schematicity mediated ethnic difference in perceived discrimination. I want to end by highlighting a social asymmetry in hypocognition. People with social privilege can often thrive in this world while hypocognitive of the worlds inhabited by others. People who are less privileged are often less hypocognitive because they can't afford to be in a world they don't feel like they belong. In fact, being able to stay hypocognitive about one's privilege is a privilege. I am Asian, female, and young. I sometimes wonder what it's like to be white, male, and old. To have the dermatological appearance of age and wisdom, to have the dermatological disadvantage of age and possibly being subject to ageism. I sometimes wonder what it's like to traverse different social worlds, to be male and female, gay and straight, dark and fair-skinned. Most of us can't do that in real life, but we can do so in our imagination by listening to each other's stories, by peering into unfamiliar worlds, by being a little less hypocognitive of our own hypocognition. I'd like to thank my collaborator, Dave Dunning, up there and uh, down here. Thank you all for listening. Thanks very much, Katie. Hi, um, I'm Taylor Phillips, presently an assistant professor at NYU Stern. Um, and I will be talking um, about a project that, uh, with a few collaborators, we, we think of as our herd invisibility work. So I'll see if I can explain what that is over the next 12 to 15 minutes. OK, so um, Katie's presentation, I think, uh, is really helping us think about the cognitive limitations to recognizing privilege. Um, and as she already referenced in her talk, this kind of fits with existing work, not that there's much, we need more work on privilege, but it fits with the um, existing work that kind of thinks of privilege as this invisible knapsack. Um, it's pretty tricky to show a picture of an invisible object, so we're just gonna go with this clear backpack as kind of our, our representation there. But this sort of invisible knapsack idea, and one way, not that Macintosh necessarily intended it this way, but one way that's presently understood in our kind of research world is that there's something about privilege that is inherently invisible. 
and these kind of cognitive explanations can help with that. Today, I'm going to turn to a slightly different mechanism and think about how invisibility, invisibility might be emergent. So not necessarily inherent, but emergent. What do I mean? So what I mean is, kind of looking at this other image here, herd invisibility, akin to a herd immunity. The idea is that individual motivations and motivated reasoning, I want to cover my privilege, I want to feel like a good person, this kind of thing, doesn't have to happen in every single individual for invisibility to nevertheless emerge. So if I'm concerned about the privilege and the evidence and I'm motivated to feel like a good person and cover this up, or other motivations, I want to keep my resources, cover this up, when I do that, does that and can that have effects on other people who are not necessarily motivated one way or the other, but are nevertheless observers in the community? And so we're thinking about this kind of emergent possibility that invisibility can come from individual motivations that nevertheless lead to invisibility at more of a group or community level. So we're going to kind of walk through how that might happen. Um, Katie already gave us great examples. I had the benefit of having seen her slides ahead of time, so I knew the left hand trick there. Here's just another example of thinking about what do we mean by privilege. It's the same definition that Katie gave us, really focusing on demographic or social identity groups and the benefits and associations, uh, benefits associated with being a member of that dominant group. So in the context of Black Lives Matter, for example, there was also a small um, kind of Twitter trend called Criming While White. So this is trying to emphasize not only the disadvantage suffered by black and brown individuals at the hands of police, but also the advantages, the privileges that are benefiting white individuals at the hands of police. And so um, our kind of existing work, and this is with um, my collaborator and advisor, Brian Lowry, who's I think somewhere over there, um, we kind of have been thinking about that, that motivational element first. So what's going on with those individual motivations when white people see criming while white hashtag or when there's some sort of kind of reminder that there's a privilege? And we sort of think about this um, in a current directions piece that I'll flag. I think people in here will be interested because it's a special issue on racism, so you probably want to see the whole issue. But anyway, in there we talk about these kind of two key motives. So one we talk about is this innocence motive. It's really a self-regard motive, right, that I, I want to feel good about myself. Am I a good person? The idea of privilege maybe makes me think I'm not a good person. And then there's also this maintenance motive, this kind of security need. Am I going to have the stuff I need or want? Yeah, if I have privilege and it's unfair, maybe someone will take it away. So a few different motives um, for why people might be motivated to cover up their privilege, make it invisible once again. How can we kind of make it invisible? Well, particularly in American context, in a meritocratic context, we really emphasize the powerful symbolism of meritocracy. So one general response that helps with either of these motives, self-regard or security, innocence or maintenance, is to say, no, no, it's not privilege. I earned it, and here's my evidence of merit. Um, we see this in real life examples coming from the political arena here. So Ann Romney, wife of bajillionaire Mitt Romney, is talking about we know what it's like to struggle, talking about hardships she has faced. Um, we're equal opportunists here, so I'll pick on the Democrats for a second as well. This one's a modern reference just a few weeks ago. Joe Biden, I'm so proud of him. Why? Well, because he has some hardships that he's faced. There seems to be a particular power around claiming hardship the way that I think about it is it's really referencing this sort of attributional dial in people's heads. The idea of privilege is saying you had external influence helping you out that was unfair. The idea of hardship is saying, no, 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 kind of turning down that external dial and saying, actually, my life's been very difficult. And so in that way, especially in a meritocratic context or an ostensibly meritocratic context, we can kind of use hardship to try to make these claims about deserving and therefore feel better about cover up the privilege um, that we've been accused of. So using merit to conceal privilege, we then think and predict is going to lead to emergent invisibility, this herd invisibility on behalf of others. So first, the self level, we're expecting that evidence of privilege, the threat of the idea that I might have privilege, is going to lead people to claim these symbols of merit, hardship, also effort, these kinds of things to say, no, no, I deserve this. Then importantly, we expect that both in the self and in others, in observers who are not necessarily motivated one way or the other. These hardship, effort, merit claims are going to lead people to change their beliefs in how much privilege is real, how much it applies to them, how much it exists. Once that belief changes, it's now going to have effects on support for policies, the very kinds of policies 
that would redress or fix privilege. If you don't think privilege is a thing, then why support the policy, yeah? And so that's where we expect this kind of spillover, this emergent invisibility to occur. So I'll walk through a few studies looking at this. Um, first, just kind of for evidence on the front end, in this um, study, we sampled white Americans. We showed half of them evidence of white privilege. The other half, we did not show that evidence. We just measured life hardships, things like my life has been full of hardships, my life has had many obstacles, etc. And this is what we found. So we told white people about their white privilege. They read that information. They came back to us and said, nah, my life's actually been really hard, right? Harder than the people who we didn't just tell that to. I think sometimes this is like, I've gotten so practiced at talking about this, I expect it, but just sit on that for a second. That, that's crazy. <laughs> we just told people and showed them evidence of how their lives were easier because they're white, and they came back and said that it was actually harder. Um, we've replicated the same kind of idea in a social class privilege context, so we don't think this has to do just with race. It's a general idea of not wanting to feel privileged. And so we see a same effect here, but this time using a social class privilege evidence prime. I've got a few other sites up there showing that this happens in gender privilege contexts. The next one is showing a sexual orientation context, and then the final one is showing a race context, but in the United Kingdom, so not just American sample. So this kind of hardship claiming, you might have heard of this as competitive victimhood, it seems to be a thing. That's the idea here. Okay, so now I'm gonna show a big thing. Don't worry, we're not gonna walk through it all. I'm just showing it to highlight a key component here, that these hardship claims have consequences. So this study was designed to kind of test the motivational element, affirmation or not, not the point of why I'm showing it right now. I really want to focus on that connection between life hardship claims and later belief in personal privilege. Once I claim that my life has been harder, I no longer think I personally have benefited from being white or wealthy or whatever it is. That, in turn, carry the negative, makes me less likely to support affirmative action policies. So that's kind of tracking through at this self level, right? A motivated reasoning account. I'm trying to cover my privilege with these symbols of merit. It changes my own belief in my own privilege, and in turn, I change my policy support. However, we're really curious about how other people experience this. Is there the spillover effect, yes or no? And so what seems to really stand out when we look at these hardships, when we look at the specific things people are claiming to try to cover the privilege again, there's a huge variety, and they're generally pretty hard. They're not, they're not fake hardships, right? People aren't saying, oh, I stubbed my toe this morning. <laughs> they're, they're real things, right? But the key is not only do they vary in terms of severity, they also vary in terms of relevance, yes? So just because I'm a woman does not counteract the fact that I have white skin, yeah? I have the value of white skin despite the disadvantages of being a woman, yeah? Same thing, we could flag this, I was bullied as a kid. That's sad, not everyone experiences that but it doesn't counteract, say, white privilege, right? The comparison there would be a white person being bullied as a kid compared to a black person being bullied as a kid, yeah? So these are not necessarily fully relevant or mitigating of privilege itself. So it turns out in our political environment, people have strong a priori political beliefs about if privilege exists or not. So my fabulous grad student, who's also sitting somewhere over there, um, thought about, well, what's a context where people might not have these kind of entrenched a priori political beliefs about privilege? Um, and we thought about nepotism. So nepotism is a great context, in part because it also is a classic way that social class privileges are propagated, right? Who you know, who your father, who your mother, who your uncle is. In this case, your uncle, nephew Skippy, hi, he's your new boss, yeah? So we turn to this nepotism context to now test how observers respond to this variety of kind of hardship claiming and covering. So in this experiment, 100 some MTurkers, they enter the study, they're reading about a work context, they read that Michael is a member of your team, his father's one of the executives, and one day you overhear someone teasing him saying, oh, you just got your job because of your dad. And then participants are in three conditions. The condition is manipulating what Michael, the target, the nepotee, what is his response? So in one case, he claims a hardship. It's kind of irrelevant, right? It's not mitigating the privilege itself. And so, hey, my parents got divorced when I was seven. Okay, that, that's sad, but it's not necessarily countering nepotism. Yeah. Here, hey, I had to work extra hard in college because of my dyslexia. Okay, well, maybe the outcome is a little different because of this. And then just a control, hey, that's not cool. All right. So the predictions here were that to the extent participants perceived the hardship claim as more severe and more relevant as two independent paths, that should lead them to have more empathy for the target, for Michael, 
In turn, once we have that empathy for Michael, we're going to think, well, Michael doesn't really have privilege, therefore privilege is not real. And that's essentially what we thought, fine. So this is a path analysis, but just kind of for sake of time, showing you all of the paths pulled out. Based on which condition you were in, in the hardship claiming, this affected perceived relevance and perceived severity. Okay, that's fine. We don't actually care about that part that much. It's the next part we we're really curious about. So to the extent you saw the hardships as severe, you had more empathy for Michael. To the extent you saw the hardships as more relevant to the claim of nepotism, you had more empathy for Michael. And then that in turn made you believe that Michael was less privileged and that inversely he was more deserving. So then in a follow-up study, we tried to kind of cross these with a fuller range of possibilities, so crossing low and high relevance, low and high severity. Again, in this case, it's kind of domain relevant, so I'll focus you on this high severity, high relevance. I have to work twice as hard for everyone else to keep from being fired. That's kind of saying, well, no, nepotism's not actually a privilege in this context. Maybe it's a risk or of a, um, a liability, right? Low relevance, low severity. My mom recently found out she has early stage cancer. Not that that's not hard. Right? It's just not mitigating the nepotism per se. So here's a terrifying path analysis. Don't worry, we're gonna just split it in half so we can actually walk through it. So I wanna show you the whole thing, it all connects, but I'm gonna split it to show you replicating that other study I just showed you and then kind of the downstream effects. So again, we see based on condition, we're uh, moving people's beliefs about the severity of the hardship claim and the perceived relevance of the claim. Those two things independently predict empathy, which in turn diminishes belief that the target is privileged. Well, why do we care about that? It turns out that affects people's policy positions. So once you don't think Michael is privileged, you do think the organization is more meritocratic, that this is a fair place, things are fine here, privilege doesn't apply. That belief, in turn, leads you to diminish your support for restricting nepotism. So that was a whole bunch of double negatives, right? But the idea is you're like, nepotism's fine. If the organization's a meritocracy, you're okay with nepotism. If the organization's a meritocracy, you're also okay with internal referrals, yeah? If the organization's a meritocracy, interestingly, we don't find effects on this kind of non-nepotism relevant domain. So we also asked about, are you interested in supporting racial diversity, hiring programs, this kind of thing. We don't see any effects there. So it does seem to be kind of contained to policies that are relevant to the privilege itself, in this case, nepotism. And I'm not quite sure where I am on time. Hopefully, if okay-ish. Great, okay. But I'm wrapping up, so I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, creating herd invisibility. What, what have I attempted to show you today? First, I want to show you this kind of motivational element, right? With several different ways that people might be motivated to cover their personal privilege. We focus especially on this kind of self-regard motive. But essentially, it leads people to claim increased personal life hardships, also effort and other merit claims that I didn't show you but are in the papers. That, in turn, leads to less belief that I personally am privileged and, therefore, in turn, less support for policies that would rectify privilege. Importantly, what we're seeing here is how this invisibility is created and emerges. These effects then spill over to observers. So neutral observers who are not motivated one way or the other are seeing these hardship claims and interpreting them, diminished belief that the target making the claim is privileged, therefore diminished belief that form of privilege exists in general, therefore diminished support for equity policies that would fix the privilege. Again, huge shout out to my fantastic advisee, Olivia Foster Gimble, and my fantastic advisor, Brian Lowry. I'm Taylor Phillips, and thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, we have Ani from Duke, but I think she might be um, moving to Tulane soon, is my understanding. And I think she will come up and change the slides and introduce herself. Thanks for the generous introduction, uh, introduction uh, Taylor. So my name is Ani, and I am really excited to be here today to share with you some of my research done with my wonderful collaborators, Aaron Kay and Keith Payne. 
So this research is about how people associate psychological agency with economic um, capitalism, and how might this contribute to gender inequality? So I first start with the observation that there's been a lot of research looking at the relationship between capitalism and wealth inequality. So for instance, uh, Thomas Piketty and um, Joseph Stiglitz, they both argue that we need more governmental uh, regulation, right? So that oftentimes the economic gains that are associated with capitalism, uh, that you know, more people can enjoy it, right? So we need more uh, governmental regulation to, to build less um, unequal, so, unequal societies. But while there has been a lot of research looking at the relationship between capitalism and wealth inequality, less research has looked at, well, how does um, capitalism shape gender inequality? So how might that play out? So to answer this, I want, to, I want you guys to think about, well, how has um, past writers and famous people talked about capitalism in the past? So if we look at what Adam Smith, who is the father of capitalism, said, he says that it is not from, uh, uh, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, and the baker that we expect our dinner, but rather from their own self-interest. And similarly, Martin Luther King Jr. says that the profit motive encourages cutthroat competition and selfish ambition. If we look at the green words over here, these are known as um, agency uh, qualities. And so what is agency? To answer this, um, we, uh, so the, the idea of agency was first coined by a psychologist called David Bacon in the 60s, who argued that agency is this general orientation um, that, pe that people have, so they tend to assert, assert the self and master the environment. And agentic qualities like, um, Agentic qualities have been studied in social uh, cognition and stereotyping literature to describe this uh, characteristics like and being ambitious, being controlling, being dominant, and often people also think that men have these qualities as opposed to women. And often in contrast to agency, we have th this notion of commonality, so people uh, which describe qualities like being friendly and warm and kind, and people often think that women have these qualities. So then based on these ideas, we propose that when you ask people to think about the qualities that are needed for success in capitalistic societies, they, like the famous thinkers in the past, they're more likely to list agency qualities, things like being ambitious, being independent, being hardworking, being competent. And because of this, because people also tend to associate these qualities with uh, men as opposed to women, people then believe that women are less likely to succeed than men in capitalistic societies. And if this uh, proposed mechanism is true, then we would, only, uh, we would predict that this effect will only occur among those who have the stereotypical beliefs, right? They are the one, some, not every, certainly not everybody believe that uh, women are less agentic than men. It's only among people who have this stereotypical beliefs that they will believe that, yeah, women are less likely to succeed in capitalistic societies because they don't have these qualities. Okay, so to test these ideas, we conducted a, um, study, an experiment, study one. So we recruited 300 participants and we randomly assigned them to one of three conditions, the high capitalist condition, the not capitalistic condition, and the socialist condition. So this was our capitalism man manipulation. So we asked people, you know, think about um, all the countries in the world, and, and, and these countries exist on the spectrum of being more or less capitalist, capitalistic or socialist, depending on the condition that they were assigned to. So we're interested in the qualities that you think will, will help a person succeed in this society. So please list as many as you can. And so here were the dependent variables that we considered. So as our first dependent variable, we, we, we counted the number of agency as opposed to commonality words that were listed in, uh, in total across these three experimental conditions. And the second dependent variable, we measured people's beliefs about gender differences and success in these societies. So do you believe that men are more likely to succeed than women in each of these societies? 
And finally, as a moderator, we measured people's stereotypical beliefs about whether women are more or less agentic than men. So um, most people believe that women are more or less ambitious, hardworking, competent, um, dominant, more, more than men or less than men. Okay, so in terms of results, we find that, as predicted, in the high capitalistic condition, people listed significantly more agency words compared to commonality-related words. You can see that this difference was also the case across the three experimental conditions. We don't observe um, a, a difference in terms of commonality, the number of commonality words listed across the three conditions, which means that when you ask people to think about you know, qualities that will help a person succeed, in, capitalist societies, they're, they're more likely to say, well, this person needs to be ambitious, independent, hardworking, competent, dominant. And then, in, term, uh, in terms of our second dependent variable, uh, which is their beliefs about whether men are more likely to succeed than women, we again found the predicted effect. So we found that people in the high capitalist condition, they're the ones who say, yes, men are more likely to succeed than Highly, in highly capital, capitalistic societies compared to the not capitalist or the socialist uh, society. Importantly, we are, we're, what we're proposing is that these differences are driven by people's agentic stereotypes about women. So it is only, so, so we will observe that this difference across conditions would be the most pronounced among people who believe that yes, women are less agentic than men because they don't have the qualities that are needed for success in highly capitalistic societies. And indeed, that is what we found. On the x-axis, we have people's stereotypical beliefs about women. So here we, have peop uh, here we have people who believe that women are less agentic than men. Here we have people who believe that women are more agentic than men. On the y-axis, we have um, this beliefs about whether men are more likely to succeed than women. And he, we see here that it is only among people who believe that, yes, women are less agentic than men, that they are the ones who think that men are more likely to succeed uh, than women in highly capitalistic society compared to uh, the other two conditions. Okay, so in study one, we've looked at how people's beliefs about capitalism and uh, shapes their beliefs about who are likely to succeed in certain societies. In study two, we wanted to look at whether actual capitalism uh, um, shapes gender inequalities, you know, objective scores across countries. So in study two, we obtained actual measures of uh, capitalism across countries, and this was using scores uh, pulled from this think tank, Heritage Foundation. And as a dependent variable, we had an objective measure of gender inequality across countries, and this was obtained from the United Nations database. So this was actually, you know, the number of female leaders in um, the Senate or the Parliament, and the gender wage gap. So it was a composite measure of how equal, unequal um, different countries are. And as a moderator variable, we had country-level beliefs about women's agency. So this was pulled from the World Value Survey and measured using two items. Men make better political leaders than women do, and men make better business leaders than women do. So again, we had cross-country measures of um, endorsement of certain stereotypes. And so again, as predicted, we found that, um, you know, here on the x-axis, we have whether people uh, agree or disagree that women possess less agency than men. And on the y-axis, we have objective gender inequality. So again, we observe that it is only among countries that tend to agree that women have less agency than men that greater capitalism was associated with greater gender inequality. And uh, among countries that tend not to show this belief, right, they disagree that women uh, possess less agency than men. We see that the link between capitalism, greater capitalism, and inequality actually reverses and flips. So this is why um, I think it's important to try to change, you know, people's beliefs, right? Because this sort of limits the extent to which capitalism, certain gains that capitalism brings might, can accrue to women across uh, countries. And so we have shown that we have shown that beliefs about capitalism and actual capitalism can shape people's beliefs about who can succeed and 
you know, their rates of actual succeeding uh, across countries. In study three, what we wanted to do was to see if this psychological link between capitalism and agency is one that is very, that has persisted, you know, across time. So to do this, we use uh, n gram r in R to script the frequency that um, agency and capitalism uh, words were used in five million printed sources, so in Google Books, and we had uh, time series data. So as we created dictionaries of capitalism, agency, and commonality. So to measure capitalism, we use three words, uh, capitalism, capitalistic, and capitalist. As agency, um, I drew on a, on a dictionary that me and my colleagues, Ashley Rosette and Christy Coville, we have developed. And uh, to measure commonality, we use uh, the dictionary, dictionary developed by a bill and colleagues. So here we see that um, evidence uh, that supports our prediction. So on the x-axis, we have uh, the frequency that agency and commonality words were used in these five million printer sources across two centuries. On the y-axis, we have frequen the frequency with which capitalism re uh, related words are used. And we see that uh, the green line shows that increased use of agency related words was positively associated with increased use of capitalism words, and the orange line shows that increased use of commonality related words was negatively associated with the use of capitalism related words. So, th so this suggests that the link between agency and capitalism is one that has persisted across two centuries. So in some, uh, in our study one, we found that people believe that agentic qualities are needed for success in capitalistic societies. And because of this, people then believe that women are less likely to succeed than men in capitalistic societies. In study two, we found that greater objective capitalism scores were associated with greater gender inequality, uh, but only in countries where people uh, believe that women are less agentic than men. And finally, in study three, we found that this link between agency and capitalism is one that is very um, entrenched, so to speak, right? So it's, it has persisted across a period of 200 years. So I'm not able to present our last study, study four. So this was a constructive replication of study one. And in addition, we asked people, you know, uh, think about a capitalist, a uh, highly capitalist society versus a not capitalistic society. And then after they wrote um, the qualities that are needed for success, they were asked to name a successful individual in each of these societies. And we found that people were more likely to name a man as opposed to a woman when thinking about the qualities, uh, when, th when asked to think about a successful person in a highly capitalistic society. Okay, so we believe that our research is important and contributes to gender research in general because um, pre, uh, previous research has largely focused on either person-based accounts, so you know, Cheryl Sandberg's lean in, the, woman, uh, the, the role of women in shaping gender inequality, or environmental-based um, accounts, which looks at um, discrimination and occupational segregation. So it's been a call for what is known as a interactionist uh, perspective of gender inequality. So looking at how the p beliefs about a person and the environment might shape gender inequality. And we think that we, our research heats this call by showing that gender inequality can be interactively shaped by our beliefs about women and our beliefs about the environment that they can thrive in. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you and um, I welcome any questions later. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Serena Hagerty, and I'm a PhD student at Harvard Business School. 
Today I'm going to be talking about a project that I'm working on in collaboration with Mike Norton, in which we look at the effects of wealth inequality on the distributive efficiency of a market. So somewhat different type of privilege, but wealth privilege. So we're in New Orleans, so let's imagine that there is an auction going on for five different Saints football jerseys. And we have five Saints fans, and they all have a general liking for all of these jerseys. But as true fans, they all have a favorite player. And so they all have a strong preference, and these preferences are distributed across the jerseys. We might assume that their money will follow their preferences. That is, they're all gonna bid on their favorite jersey. But a couple of the individuals may bid on several of the jerseys. That is, they bid on their favorite, and maybe they bid on their second and third choice. In such a scenario, we may end up with two individuals who are competing against the same jersey. So who's going to win this auction? Past literature, using willingness to pay and bidding behavior, would assume that whichever individual values that jersey the most will submit the higher bid and win. That is, if it's true that the player in the middle truly values the jersey more than the player on the right, they'll submit a higher bid and win. That is, in a competitive market, if there's true distributive efficiency, the jerseys will go to the individuals who value the, the most. But in a lot of these assumptions that variations in willingness to pay reflect variations in pre preferences, we often ignore the fact that there may be substantial variations in ability to pay. So if we look at the same auction, but now we have substantial wealth inequality amongst the players, and we have the same scenario, do we still think that the player in the middle will win their favorite jersey? Or is it the case that the player on the right may be willing to pay more for a jersey that they actually like relatively less? And subsequently, will the wealthiest individual end up with more jerseys? So in this research, we ask this question. Simply, how does wealth and equality in a competitive market disrupt the market efficiency? That is, do goods still go to those who value them the most? And we think this is an important question because, as many of you may know, wealth inequality has been rising over the past 40 years, particularly in the United States. So to study this, we try to simulate a competitive market. So we brought in 50 players or participants from MTurk to compete in a live auction that we ran through Otree platform. So in this auction, we brought in the players and we randomly assigned them to auction groups of five people. And we gave them a base endowment that they could, some money that they could spend in this auction. But importantly, we varied what that endowment was. So within these groups of five individuals, we created a highly unequal market that reflects the true wealth distribution of the United States. And rather than bid on football jerseys, we had individuals bidding on five different gift cards. And for each of these gift cards, we told them how much it was worth to them. That is, we assigned their private valuations. So rather than trying to compare liking for a jersey, which is ambiguous and may vary across participants, we actually assign these valuations and randomize them across the gift cards for each participant. So the key of this design is that we can actually compare the valuation or the liking of each card across participants, and we can also compare an individual's bidding amount to their private valuation. And this was a second priced auction, so we really wanted to make sure that participants understood that in this auction, the dominant strategy is always to bid your private valuation to ensure that you never pay more for a gift card than it's truly worth to you. So we ran participants through a couple of hypothetical scenarios to make sure that they understood this strategy. So importantly, we included scenarios in which the participant was able to earn an additional bonus by bidding at their private valuation or beneath it. And we also included scenarios in which the participant bid above their private valuation and was then at risk for some monetary loss. So once all participants had their base endowments, understood their private valuations for each of the gift cards and went through a variety of these exercises to make sure they understood the auction, we invited them to bid on up to five cards. So they could bid anywhere between zero and five, on, bid on zero to five cards. So what happened? So participants in the wealthiest quintile 
or wealthiest condition, ended up spending a smaller percentage of their endowment overall, but this still meant that they were spending more money in absolute terms. But importantly, these participants were not simply bidding their private valuation across all five gift cards, which would be the dominant rational strategy, but actually they were overbidding at much higher rates. So that is, they were paying six cents for a five cent gift card. And importantly, we see this overbidding behavior in only 2% of participants in the lower quintile, but we see it in 33% of participants in the highest quintile. So they're overbidding at more, uh, more frequently, and they're also overbidding in more absolute terms. So we were then interested in how this overbidding behavior actually affected the allocation of goods in the market. So we know that the wealthier participants are bidding more, so they're winning more. And this is dis disrupting the distributive inefficiency of this market. So while the private valuations for the gift cards were distributed evenly across all participants, we see that almost half of the gift cards went to the wealthiest player in each auction group. Um, in comparison, only about 30% of gift cards actually went to the player who had the highest value for it. Said otherwise, the player's endowment condition was a better predictor of whether they would win a gift card than how much they actually valued the gift card. And ultimately, we see that the market results in greater inequality than at the onset. So because these wealthier participants are winning more gift cards, their payout is greater. But importantly, it's not as high as it would be if they had actually followed a more rational strategy of bidding their private valuations. That is, by overbidding, the wealthier participants open themselves up to the opportunity of actually losing or having a monetary loss on a gift card because they had to pay more than it was worth to them. So we actually see this occurs in about 20% of gift cards that were won. Another way of looking at the waste in this market is by looking at the bid amount and subtracting the second price paid. So that is the wealthiest participants are bidding on average about like three cents more than they needed to, and this money could have just been kept for themselves or spent on other cards. So ultimately what we see is that by endowing participants with an abundant budget to spend in this auction, we actually see that they're not using the money appropriately by bidding their private values, but they tend to actually overbid. And this overbidding behavior is disrupting the market efficiency by creating a market that favors the wealthy and not those who actually have the highest value for the goods. Additionally, we see evidence that this is creating waste in the market overall. So we've run this paradigm in a couple of different ways. So in one of the studies, we actually did it with YouTube videos, and we auctioned off videos. And we manipulated whether the inequality was fully transparent or not. And we actually find in that study that transparency exacerbates these effects. So rather than understanding their relative advantage and bidding less and simply just trying to win, we actually see that increasing transparency increases competition. And so the wealthier participants overbid on more items that they like even less. So moving forward, we hope to replicate that and test that with the new gift card um, that allows us to compare private valuations more accurately. And we're also interested in looking at how this is affected by whether participants feel like they've earned or have randomly been endowed these, their base payments. And again, from the study we ran with the YouTube videos, what we found is that these players were actually winning more videos and actually consuming them less. So we're interested in exploring this effect more, that these wealthy people are actually, sorry, wealthy being randomly endowed wealth, but they're actually accumulating more goods that they like less and are consuming less of, another way of measuring waste in the market. Thank you.
take Q and A questions. Yeah, so what we're interested in exploring more is kind of this like hyper-competitive mindset to see if that might help explain the effects we're seeing. So is it, you know, stinginess is not what we're seeing, right? So is it this desire to win just to win and that these participants are actually will, like knowingly taking a loss just to feel like winners is something that we're interested in. Um, I don't have anything to speak to it at the moment, but it's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, one, the other thing we're thinking about, I mean, you spoke about giving to charity, is if you overaccumulate, are you then willing to donate some of your, like the videos that you won or the gift cards that you won, some of the bonus? Um, so that's definitely a study we've thought about running. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great, great question. I especially like this question because this is essentially what I hope to do with my career. So the idea, um, the idea here, in case folks couldn't hear the question, um, is, okay, we see this kind of competitive victimhood, this hardship claiming effect that seems to be happening across different groups. It's being replicated now. Um, how do we make that stop, right? That, that seems unhealthy and not, not helpful for kind of intergroup relations. Um, so there's a few things. In a couple of the papers um, that I put up there, we're using a variety of kinds of affirmations um, to kind of play around with this. Um, and we do find in that work um, that self-affirmation helps. So in the study I showed you, I told you to kind of ignore that part. But now that you've asked, self-affirmation can help um, change that association with being exposed to evidence of privilege and subsequent subsequent hardship claiming. Um, so that helps in um, a more recent paper that's forthcoming in JPSB focused on social class privileges. We also compare this with a system affirmation. So maybe it's something about, well, you're telling me the system is unfair and that's also threatening in some way. Um, interestingly, we do find that that reduces some of the hardship claiming, but it doesn't lead to the same effect of belief that you're personally privileged later. Right, so it, it kind of makes people less defensive, we sort of think, in a, oh, there's privilege, we don't care kind of way. So that seems bad. I think more realistically to answer the question, it's kind of hard to just whip out a self-affirmation worksheet anytime you're engaging in this conversation. Um, so one thing I and a couple of grad students are pursuing is um, this kind of increasing presence that we see. I, I've thought about sort of meta-analyzing even just within my own date over the past decade or so, this increasing uh, political ideology effect in which liberals are increasingly more likely to recognize their privilege and specifically not show these defensive responses, whereas when I first started this work, we were not seeing that. Liberals were just as defensive as conservatives. And so I think that's theoretically interesting because what it's saying is if you can provide people an outside um, sort of reassurance that, yeah, yeah, you're still a good person, don't worry, kind of a reassurance of that self-regard, political ideology might be providing that, right? So by being a good liberal, by being a good member of my political group, which in this case requires recognizing privilege, I'm still feeling okay about myself while still being able to, of course, actually recognize the privilege and importantly, 
do the things required once I hit recognition. So interesting question. Happy to talk with you more about it later if you have ideas for me or if anyone else has ideas. But something where um, my lab group's actively trying to pursue. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of papers. We have not tried that specifically, but some of the reason is because there's a couple of papers that have tried something like this. Um, so Ashley Rosette um, has a paper, Rosette and Toast, Toast? Rosette and Toast or Toast, I'm, I apologize, Lee, Lee Toast. Okay, Rosette and Toast, 2013, um, where they do look at, okay, well, you're disadvantaged as a woman, let's say, but you're advantaged because you're white. Does that make you more willing to recognize white privilege? The findings are kind of interesting. I think they're complex. It might make you a little more willing to recognize privilege, but not do anything about it, right? Because it kind of feels like, well, it's balanced out. I get benefits from whiteness, damages from womenness. Okay, move on. Um, so I do think it's this kind of complex issue of multiple identities. Um, Mo Craig and her student um, Ariana Brown also have a paper looking at this. If you think about privilege in one identity, how are you then kind of hardship or discrimination claiming? We have some similar data on this kind of increasing discrimination claims on other identities. Um, so I do think what seems to have worked for us is really addressing that self-regard component rather than this scorekeeping sort of um, mechanism. So, so that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Thanks for the question. Okay, that's a pretty long delay. Maybe I'll say, I'm sure the rest of us are happy to sit up here in case folks have questions they don't wanna say out loud in this big room. Um, and thank you very much to Katie for being our esteemed organizer.